Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Lisa Maladnik. I'm a Roman Catholic, a professional life coach, and a Clifton Strengths coach certified by the International Coaching Federation and the Gallup Corporation. The Wonderfully Made show is all about the intersection of faith and talent. Our guest tonight is Father Boniface Hicks, a Benedictine monk, retreat leader, and strengths coach. But before I bring Father Boniface on, I'd like to explain that in our conversation today, we'll be using the language of the world-renowned talent and personality profile, the Clifton Strengths Assessment. So we'll be talking about talent themes, which are ways to identify the powerful, God-given potential found in all of us, and the idea of strengths, which is when talents are mature. It's when your natural capabilities become so well-developed they become part of your personal style and help you perform with consistent excellence for God's glory and your greater joy. Because when we know our own design, we experience gratitude and greater confidence, love, and appreciation for the designer. Tonight, it's my joy to welcome Father Boniface. Father Boniface Hicks OSB is a Benedictine monk of St. Vincent Arch Abbey in La Trobe, Pennsylvania. Since his ordination to the priesthood in 2004, he has provided spiritual direction for many men and women, including married couples, seminarians, consecrated religious, and priests, even while completing his PhD in computer science at Penn State University. He became the programming manager and an on-air contributor for We Are One Body Catholic Radio in 2010, and has recorded thousands of radio programs on theology and the spiritual life. Father Boniface has extensive experience as a retreat master for laity, consecrated religious, and priests. He became the director of spiritual formation for St. Vincent Seminary in 2016, and in 2018, he became a founding contributor of the Institute for Ministry Formation at St. Vincent Seminary. Together with Father Thomas Acklin OSB, he is the author of Spiritual Direction, a Guide for Sharing the Father's Love, and Personal Prayer, a Guide for Receiving the Father's Love. Contact Father Boniface Hicks at imf.stvincentseminary.edu. Welcome to the program, Father Boniface. Thank you so much, Lisa. Great to be with you. Oh, thank you so much. Now, um, for everybody watching on the screen, you'll see some colorful banners with Father Boniface's top 10 talent themes, and those are in domain colors. We'll, we'll do a little flyover of that in just a few minutes and go deeper into how they help Father Boniface thrive and succeed, as well as how they may present some struggles for him. But first, let's talk a little bit, uh, Father, about some of the work you do at the seminary, especially in your role as a strength coach. Would you put us in the context of how that plays into your work? Well, first of all, my role in the seminary, I'm the director of spiritual formation for uh, diocesan seminarians. Our seminary forms parish priests and dioceses, as well as our own monks. Uh, they have a separate formation for spiritual and human formation, so I'm not as directly involved. But for the diocesan priests, I'm, or diocesan seminaries, I'm, I'm directly involved. And my primary role is spiritual direction. I'm I give spiritual direction to a number of the men, and that means uh, meeting twice a month and talking with them about their spiritual lives and helping them to discern and work through issues in their prayer and develop their relationship with God. I also, as part of that role on staff at St. Vincent Seminary, teach a formation course, which is just a once a week course for uh, an, an hour a week, and there's no homework, and it's really meant to be for formation and it gives us a chance to fill in some things that don't fit into the academic curriculum quite as well and several years ago i had the chance to be trained as a strengths coach and i found it to be extremely valuable even for people that i had met with uh, multiple times a month or monthly for uh, over a decade the insights that i gained from looking at their strengths profile in some cases gave me vocabulary to describe qualities I had recognized. In other cases, had given me insights that I hadn't uh, recognized before. And I found that to be so valuable. And then the team dynamics and the mutual understanding was such a gift that I thought, this is something the seminarians would really benefit from. And so I took a, the opportunity to use my one of my formation courses for the men who are in their second year of major theology. So 
At the end of third theology, they're ordained deacons. At the end of fourth theology, they're ordained priests. So you can see there, uh, and they, they've already had two to three years in seminary at that point. And I had them uh, trained in strengths and coached, and then I led them in some of the, the team uh, formation just as a, as a class, and then have steadily spread strengths finders throughout our seminary, and then it spread into the monastery, and it's all been very grassroots, but the men have taken to it so much that the men who haven't had it yet are excited about finding what is their strength profile and when are they going to get some coaching and they're interested in, in the uh, insights and opportunities that come through, through Strength Finders. So it's really in kind of an organic way in my role in the seminary as a spiritual director and then just doing a little bit of the, uh, the formation as a regular part of the seminary formation that I was able to introduce Strength Finders there. Wow, it's amazing because as a coach, it's always been very important to make the distinctions between therapy and coaching or spiritual direction and coaching. But here you are with spiritual directees and, and you know, using those talents as kind of entry points for a deeper exploration or whatever that may be. And I'm finding even just as a straight coach, and I do not attempt to be a spiritual director, that my clients do discover unique pathways for more intimate contact tact with God in terms of their own design and how he has made them to relate to him. And so I can easily see why as a spiritual director, you would, you would discover that and it would become a real powerful pathway in even deeper, I would think. Yeah, God wants to relate with us uh, out of the fullness of who we are, the way that he made us. And I find, uh, depending on people's comfort around their own talent themes, they may have a tendency to suppress one theme or highlight another theme. We, we like to put our best foot forward and uh, relate to others, especially those we want to impress according to the best that we have. Our relationship with God requires us to relate to him out of all that we are. And, and being able to kind of see the whole gamut of who we are and, and to bring all of that before him, uh, the, the various kinds of, of talent themes that we have and certainly leveraging those, but not being afraid of saying like, you know, you didn't make me great at this. And uh, I know that you love me in that. Like, I can't do this well and I struggle at it, but I know that you love me there and I'm not afraid to show you those things or even complain about them a little bit. Why do I have to do this in my life? Find me some way to reframe or delegate this thing. Uh, but just, just having that self-awareness that we're able to come to the Lord more honestly uh, is, is what develops, what deepens our, our relationship with him ultimately. Yeah. And, and I've noticed with my clients, and I imagine because they're human beings too, that priests and religious may have some of these issues too. We often enter into the coaching process with false ideas about our identity, which I would think would be real barriers to intimacy with God, because a lot of those false ideas uh, kind of hang around our necks like millstones. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, that false identity, which, uh, you know, I found in, in seminary, for example, it's interesting that we, uh, in, the, in the four domains, the, it's, of course, the strategic thinking domain is highly rewarded because you get grades for courses. And, and the execution domain, in kind of a related way, is highly rewarded. You figure out the seminaries that can get stuff done. Uh, the influencing domain is a little bit of a mixed bag, depending on how strong the ego is of your uh, seminary uh, leaders. If the rector and the vice rector have, have a weak ego and they're afraid of the influencing guy, then that can be sort of suppressed or cast out. I've seen that in different seminaries. I'm grateful uh, that our, our rector and vice rector are marvelous people and really reward that kind of leadership that steps forward. Um, but ironically, in seminary, the relationship building strengths are the ones that are least rewarded. There just isn't really a structure for identifying and really giving the men a chance to press into that. They don't have a chance to form harmony or to do a lot of including or to be noticed that they're including or to do a lot of deep relating or just to be noticed. Maybe they have a deep friendship, but that doesn't show up on their profile. And so the relationship building strengths are the things that, of course, we want in our priests, right? <laughs> Please, God, give us priests that can relate with people. Uh, mm. But, you know, they tend not to be rewarded in seminary. And it can be to the point that, uh, to get back to your, 
your insight about prayer that a man is actually really good, maybe high relator, high individualization, high includer, high harmony, even high empathy. And, and he thinks like those are a little bit of an albatross. You know, they kind of hold me back. I wish that I could get better grades and think better and get things done. And I wish I had some influence on people and I wish I could do some of these other things. And so I go to God feeling like somewhat of a failure when in fact, he's given me these beautiful talents to work with and uh, they're enriching my life, but they're just not being rewarded by the seminary structure. So those are the kinds of things that can get, uh, get in the way of our relationship with God, that false image, like you said. Yeah, and the neat thing about strengths is, number one, whatever's before you, you can use your talents as a lens for how you best move into that challenge, right? So you'll do it uniquely. You'll address it, surmount that challenge uniquely. But it can also indicate, and you're working in teams and things like that in the parish setting, how best to delegate and who's going to get really fired up and motivated and feel really seen and heard when you call that strength out in them. So on the one hand, you can apply your talents to whatever God places in your path to some degree, to a very large degree, and, and in keeping in mind that you may need help as well. But at the same time, uh, it, it does help you to sort of share the burden. Yeah, and when the when the men realize that there is this uh, this kind of diversity between them, uh, a lot of beautiful things happen. One is sometimes the quality that drives you nuts about the guy that lives next door, you, you start to get some insight around. Oh, I see. In a different way, that's a strength. <laughs> and he's, uh, you know, especially someone maybe who's high and deliberative, and it's like, oh gosh, you know, do you just like? can't you just do the thing? You know, do you really have to think through everything? Do you have to come up with all the problems? I mean, can you just get it done after all? And then you start to see, oh no, I just need to give that guy a little bit of space. And then he's going to avoid a lot of problems for us. And when he starts moving, he's going to get the job done. And, and if we just start to learn to work around those things a little bit, uh, then we, we realize, uh, okay, well, we need to not bring him into the brainstorming session where we need a little freedom to move and, and explore some ideas, but uh, we really need him before we like hit the button and, and start moving with a project. And, and so that, that kind of insight really helps the, the group dynamics, team dynamics, helps us understand how to, how to delegate, how to share the load. Uh, yeah, just a, a great gift for a lot of the things that go on in a se seminary community is uh, we have men who are spending, uh, you know, so it's like college, but there's only 35 guys living together. And so it really is a community we have, we pray together multiple times every day, we have meals together every day, and then we, they go to class by class. And so there's a lot of those inner human tensions that that can build up where a little insight, self-awareness and other awareness that Strength Finders provides is a, is a big benefit. Mm. Yeah, and I love what you said before about not taking it personally, because I work with married couples as well, and I know you do too. And um, sometimes, like for me, with Activator at three and my husband very highly deliberative for a long time, it was like, oh, did you get moving? And and he was like, oh my gosh, would you slow down, make make better decisions? I'm so impulsive. And so once we kind of understood each other a little better, like I can help to get him moving, I can gently kind of ignite forward motion sometimes. But the important thing is I can respect his need to deliberate. I can say, I'd like to talk about this sometime this week. How about this day? Give him a chance to mentally prepare and to ask his own questions and come to the table prepared instead of springing things on him. And he helps me, as you said, you know, maybe not bring him into the brainstorming, but he's going to help me make better decisions. That's awesome. I haven't done as much work with married couples on strength finders. I have a couple of examples that uh, are, are really delightful. A, a similar kind of pair, a, a, a wife who is number one discipline and has like mapped out her day to the five minute intervals. I mean, it's <laughs> a, just amazing to behold. And, and her husband is really high adaptability. And I think oh he's number God. 34 discipline. And, and he's just, a, they're both beautiful people, but they had this thing. And, and, we tend to absolutize those kinds of qualities. The person who's like really structured and, and, and can be really organized and have everything mapped out. We have a little bit of a, 
a, a, a love fest around those kinds of people in our society in general. Like that's the ideal. And people who are undisciplined are a mess. You know, they're like a disaster. They can't organize their lives. They're just one step next to homeless. You know, I mean, <laughs> we have these kinds of narratives that go around. And, and to see on Strength Finders, no, like she's really high and, and she loves this. And, and he couldn't do this to save his life. I mean, and so that helped them tremendously to just understand each other and accept each other where they are and then learn how to work with that. He has other inroads that she's able to tap into. And, and you know, he knows that he can lean on her discipline with certain things. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's great the way that it can work out. Really gives some insight around sometimes some long lasting marital problems. Yes. And I love to say that the high discipline spouse I'll bet your spouse who's high in adaptability or, or whatever it may be that's really remarkably different is able to be really fully present to you in the moment. And she'll say, oh, that's so true, but she never really put her finger on it before. I've also noticed one other thing. You're right, productivity, organization, right? That's the big American thing. And yet I had a very uh, well-known and well-respected successful ministry leader come to me in coaching who actually had diagnosed himself as OCD until he looked at his consistency and discipline and realized he was not only talented, but it was at that moment. He was really good at setting best practices and expectations for everyone's job roles on his teams, but he thought because he was always taking notes and crossing every T and dotting every I that was something wrong with him. But when he realized what it was, he, he recognized his talent and right between sessions, his bishop asked him to do an exploration of best practices in youth ministry for the diocese. And he and the timing was amazing. Like I'm getting shivers remembering. The next time I talked to him, I said, you sound so free. And he said, I am free. I'm confident for the first time. Wow, that's amazing. How beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing when we can put that positive spin and, and I know uh, you recognize that pattern too. I, I often say very simply, our strengths can become our defenses. And that's when they sort of over function and they can sometimes create some problems because what else are we going to defend ourselves with? Not our weaknesses, God knows. So, you know, we're going to use the things that we actually feel comfortable and confident about. But then that thing, which is really what God gave us to be uh, fruitful and loving and, and be, be a gift that becomes a defense, it becomes a, a kind of weapon, and then that can create some tensions and difficulties between people, whether it's uh, OCD, which of course turns a bit inward, um, or whether it's you know something like command or uh, some of the influencing strengths that can really start to push on other people, or you know even some of those relationship building strengths that we retreat to certain places. But I always remember Father James Mallon, who is the founder of Divine Renovation and has done tremendous work in parish renewal, uh, took strength finders and saw his top five and said, this is crazy. These are the things I bring to confession every week. <laughs> and then with some coaching came to understand how these are really the great gifts that enabled him to do so much of the great work that he did. But again, our strengths become our defenses. So they can become kind of supercharged when we feel threatened, when we're in unsafe environments and we feel like we have to prove ourselves and then we sort of supercharge the things we're good at and they can overfunction or dysfunction in some ways. Yeah, and inadvertently our our beautifully designed brains do sometimes reward bad behavior because whenever we're operating in a natural talent, we get an endorphin payback in the brain. And the brain's all super happy because we're over commanding or over communicating or something. <laughs> and we feel great. And everybody else, as you said, we're pushing in on other people. We're not landing well. And that can happen with any of the talents. Um, have you found that just helping the seminarians not only to understand each other, but to understand how they land in the way that they operate? and maybe to mitigate that a little or advocate them for themselves a little bit? Are you noticing that need? Well, certainly, as I mentioned, uh, with relationship building strengths, not being as immediately rewarded by the external structures, I've had several guys who have, you know, five, seven relationship building strengths in their top 10 and really helping them to find some outlets for that so that they get and then to really appreciate that they have that to offer. And we have some nice outreaches because we're on a college campus. We have sports chaplaincies. We have opportunities to help in campus ministry. And 
So some places that a seminarian is able to step into a role to do a little bit of listening and, and supporting and, and relating with some of the, the students in ministry and, and exercise that, that's been, uh, that's been very helpful to have them advocate for themselves that way. Um, I, <laughs> I have another, uh, the, the class I have this year, one of the guys has three influencing strengths in his top 10. And that has become my formula for what usually makes up a CEO. And so I've kind of <laughs> playfully, you know, told him like, you know, and, and, uh, and he has a mix. He's also from Vietnam. He's learned English as a second language. And, but he's just, he does so many things. It's uh, he's like activator communication and, and uh, maximizer. Maybe anyway, it's a, uh, he's just has this marvelous, like he's wonderful to have in the seminary and he just makes all these things happen. And and it caused a little bit of difficulty because I know he's very smart and he can do well in his classes. And but his influencing strengths are so strikingly different than the other seminarians who don't have that kind of robust, uh, innovative and and uh, you know initiating quality to them that uh, he didn't really know how to fit this in. Or and and he and he learned to say to his human formator, uh, you know the he said, well this, this is the way. I started to realize now I have a name for these things. You know, this is the way that I'm I'm made, and these are special gifts that I have, and and it's helped him to really own it and lean into it, and know that this is something that that he can offer. In other cases, there are guys, a uh, couple of guys who are like, you know, top five responsibility, even number one responsibility, and of course they're in agony all the time because nobody else takes things as seriously as they do. I mean, and I know who those guys are. And I ask them, like, can you do this for me? They say they're going to get it done. I don't think a se another second about it. I just move on with my life. I know it's going to get done. <laughs> but they, of course, agonize. Like, nobody else gets anything done. You know, they say he's going to, he's going to do something. He's going to show up. And he's, you know. And uh, so helping them to understand, no, this is part of what God has given you. This is a real gift. And you've developed that. And and it's it's a real strength in your life. But other people are even like bottom five responsibility, and it's not because they're bad people. <laughs> they just <laughs> they just don't have that. They have to find other ways to work with that. But um, so uh, some of that uh, really appreciating who they are and being able to lean into that. Some guys who who can really see they're they're high in input, high in learner, and other guys who struggle. Um, just really really able to appreciate the the diversity and, and certainly to uh, push into their own strengths. Oh, I love that. It's so exciting to see it happen. And I love that the guy are, uh, with high responsibility who might even be scrupulous because they, uh, they take on and identify so much with the commitments that they make that, it, as you said, they can be in pain a lot about not being able to finish by the end of the day or, or on time or whatever that may be because other things come up. And so they really do suffer with carrying that load. But to understand it and understand that God created it in them and purposed it and that God is a gentle God, that they can start to bring it to him in prayer and, and, and maybe say, Lord, you know, what did you design this for? And how, how do I make peace with it? I often will tell my high achieving uh, clients, um, you know, with a lot of executing themes, that's the purple folks for what, those of you watching, um, is to sort of befriend them like your beloved children. You can say to Achiever at the end of the day, you know what, you did really well today. Go to sleep. <laughs> 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 You're done. It's good. Like pat, that. pat, pat, pat. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, another uh, thing I've really come to appreciate is a, a psychological model based on subpersonalities called internal family systems. And it, it works on uh, a, an understanding of parts. And we say this, there's a part of me that really wants to achieve. There's a part of me that really wants to relate with people. There's a part of me that. And uh, internal family systems has really developed that in a very robust way. But those are, those are two things that float around together. There's an achieving part of me. And, and you know, as, it, as I recognize a personality, or if you've seen the movie Inside Out, you know, it displays the, the five little parts that are inside of all of the characters. And they sort of identify that with one emotion, but I think there's a more robust personality there. But in any event, I love what you said, uh, you know, really identifying 
our, our strengths, maybe sometimes a collection of strengths as a, as a little person in us that's kind of working and running through things and thinking in a certain way and, and operating in a certain way. And it's, uh, those are parts of ourselves that we should love. Yeah. 100%. And, and also I've, I've uh, noticed that people can find a lot of peace by looking at their intrinsic needs as well as their blind spots, like bringing blind spots, as you said before, related to um, into the confessional, like where are my talents maybe um, not functioning well or not being other oriented or not well self-managed. Um, that aspect I find really helpful for people. It just helps them know themselves better and kind of reconcile those things and be able to target them and not be so afraid of themselves. And also understanding their underlying needs and which ones are being met and which ones are not and where they can meet God there. So in that area that can be identified sort of in our American culture as weaknesses, things we don't see automatically or easily, mistakes we tend to make, and needs that need, have to be met for us to stay healthy and whole. Um, where are you seeing the, you know, that kind of, um, the vulnerable side of it, I guess I would call it? Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I know for myself, there was a, there was a great growth in both discovering my, uh, my top, five top 10 and and also the the bottom five and just being able to own you know i'm i have woo in my bottom five uh and and priests and i'm you know whatever invited into a lot of different settings and i walk into a room full of strangers and i just energy just starts draining out of me and uh i just want to go somewhere else and uh so it gave me some language around that, some insight around that. Like, yeah, I'm just not high and woo. And this isn't something that if I work on, I'm going to get better. That's always a question in the back of my mind, you know, like, well, maybe I need to learn some skills or take a workshop or do a thing, you know? And uh, it's like, <laughs> no, it's really just not going to get a lot better. I mean, uh, the neural pathways are fairly solidified and it's, we're just not going to move these things. And that just gave me a lot of freedom around that. And then on the other hand, I have a couple of my my brother monks who I've done ministry with who are number one, number two woo. And I love going into those spaces with them. And I just kind of stand in their shadow and they meet people and then they move on. And then I pick up the people that they just met and they broke the ice. They made the introduction. I met the person and then I'm number one input. I'm always tuned into things I can pick up from other people. Like, oh, when this other priest met him. He said he was a nuclear engineer. I'm like, that's fascinating. I want to learn everything about nuclear engineering. And this guy wants to tell me everything about nuclear engineering. We can talk the rest of the social event. And so just being able to like step into that space and not feel, uh, not beat myself up that I'm not the social guy, that I can't do the thing that the other guy does. And uh, I know I have my, my own gift. And even with this one priest in particular from my order, he's a uh, just a really gifted evangelist, um, but he couldn't meet with people for spiritual direction, just doesn't have that kind of interpersonal commitment, low relator, you know, and uh, that's easy for me. I love that. It's totally life-giving. I meet with six, seven, eight people a day, I mean, and, and get energized by it. And so I recognize the complementarity that's there. And that's, that's such a, a beautiful gift. Mm, it truly is. And and for the sake of the audience, too, I want to say a little bit about Relator, because I have Wu at number seven, and my husband's high in Relator, and he can spot a phony a mile off, and I can't. I fall into the weeds with all sorts of people, and I don't see it coming, and I get hammered sometimes. Whereas if my husband is with me, he's like, danger danger like he knows immediately and um and the other thing just wanted to say about relator is that that power of the one-on-one -on -one, the ability to deep dive with somebody you're not going to want to be scattershot all over the room like woo you know that that charge they get from winning others over which is what woo stands for but you are a deep sea diver so and plus you have high intellectual themes so you're also able to have those deep conversations in that realm too that fast mental processing that creative way of and you've got your uh let's see your individualization your connectedness is high so that ability also there's a place of connection there with other people but also with ideas and the importance 
of how things connect. Could you say a little bit more about your own talent themes, Father, and and like what do they mean to you? Do you mind just going through them a little bit and maybe pulling out some of your favorites? Do a little more. Sure. Yeah, I was really uh, learning strength finders and uh, just given the permission with number one input, number two learner, which just have a way of kind of supercharging each other. Uh, permission to take intentional input time. And I started uh, just treating myself to a half an hour of reading at the end of the day and made it like a task, you know? So uh, I will do this. This is something that's important. And so I will do it. And I started working through a couple of books that way. And then it, it got to the point I've, I've wanted to do an additional theology program. I did a uh, doctorate in computer science as I, uh, after I was ordained, I came into the monastery with a master's degree, taught computer science during seminary. And then after I was ordained, we have a college. And so we need a uh, doctoral, uh, well-formed professors. So I went to get my doctorate and, and uh, anyway, that was its own uh, adventure, but I finished that in an unusually short time and came back and started uh, teaching a bit, but really wanted to be formed in theology. And so after learning strength finders, I thought, well, if this energy thing is true, that you actually get energy from the things you do well, I should be able to like take on an educational program and it should provide its own energy. So I literally, without removing anything from my schedule, just started uh, basically a doctoral program in theology, a licentiate program. And uh, it's an online program, so I could do all of my stuff between like 10 p.m. and midnight. And I had energy for that. I was excited at 10 p.m. to like start doing studies, listening to lectures, reading things, writing papers, and uh, just found that it provided its own energy. So uh, I love that, that input theme. And I constantly collect things. You know, I, I saw, oh, 34 talent themes in Strength Finders. This is amazing. Like, this is exactly what I want to learn. I want to learn people differentiated at 34 different levels. And I want to learn all of these themes and just lots of energy around that. And uh, just such a joy to, to press into all of those categories. And it really makes, uh, so I have a lot of relationship building themes as well, uh, positivity and developer and individualization relator. Uh, and uh, I love people and connectedness and I love, but it's also input and it sort of mutually reinforces each other because I never met a person with this talent set before. Uh, what is this like? And I'm ready to discover this person in this vocation, this person with these experiences. The, so the input is really something, uh, a lens through which I live much of my life, uh, just receiving so much from, from other people and, and from learning. Um, the, the connectedness is, is really a joy for me. I, um, I, I mean, I have my finger in many, fingers in many different pies. And one of my great joys is to bring people together. I love for my friends to meet my friends. And I recently found this uh, online social networking platform called Mighty Networks that I uh, bought for the Institute for Ministry Formation. So we have our own space. And it was my greatest joy to form groups that were specialized, but then it has the big group space where all of my friends can meet all of my friends. So I have my clergy friends, and my spiritual director friends, and my psychology friends, and my, my ministry friends, my, my directees. I have doctors and businessmen, and I just love for all my friends to meet all my friends. So uh, the connectedness space is, is a real joy. And, and the connectedness in terms of ideas, which I, I think goes together with ideation, uh, which is anywhere somewhere in my signature set, um, I love putting ideas together and generating new ideas from existing ideas. Uh, so that's a, a real joy for me. The, the maximizer reinforces the fact that I'm number 34 restorative. And I, I couldn't really figure out why it was that I could get a doctorate in computer science, but actually like the practice, the day-to-day -day of computer science just killed me. And uh, especially as I got back to the monastery and I was teaching and I just, the energy was just draining out of me. And then it was really strength finders that I, I eventually uh, ab abandoned ship and the, the abbot gave me permission to explore a different direction. I got involved in a radio ministry, which was a lot of input. I was like in heaven, but <laughs> um, I, I realized 
going through Strength Finders, what, what happened is to get a PhD is high input, high learner, connectedness, maximizer, intellection, my whole top five. And then I was working with an amazing team of people at Penn State. So uh, all of my positivity, individualization, developer, like uh, all of this stuff was alive. When I got back to the college and I started doing computer science, I was working with people that didn't really want to be there. I was having to fix a lot of problems. There were messes involved, people that weren't doing things right. Computer science, uh, really, you know, getting into the details, it's a lot of fixing broken stuff. And I just thought, oh, this is just terrible. But I finally had some language to understand why getting a PhD was very different than doing computer science. <laughs> and <laughs> was was able to, uh, you know, be, be a little saved from the the shame of failure uh, when I, I should have, uh, you know, by some standards have, have been more successful there. So that was a, a wonderful discovery. As I, as I mentioned, um, well, things like uh, positivity, individualization, developer, together with the intellectual strengths, uh, many people say I'm the best affirmer and encourager they've ever known because uh, it's just, it naturally pours out of me. It's not like I have to make an effort. I get a joy out of it, really. And I can affirm people, not just in a general sense, like you're super, uh, you're great, <laughs> we're glad you're here, which is its own value. Uh, that's not a bad thing, but I can really tell people in very specific ways. And that's, you know, part of the combination, I think, of those intellectual strengths with the relationship building in that space. And then always uh, loving to work with well, I, I really discovered this. I, I, you know, I did some work with college students. Um, I really found more joy with graduate students, theology students. And, and, I, and I think that was the maximizer really kicking in. I, I love to work with things that are working and then really make them excellent. And I'm constantly in, a, in an improvement cycle. I, I've taught a number of courses for years. It's always better the next year. And I'm always working on it, always more input, always pouring that back in, always improving. And that hasn't, it's not a perfectionist thing. I don't have like an anxious need for it. I really have a joy in, in continuing to improve and finding new ways to approach things and learning to teach my students in more effective ways. And it's kind of that input maximizer sort of cycle has been uh, has been a real gift for me. And well, then it's I feel nice like you're, I was just gonna say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I feel like your developer is showing up there too because the improvement rather than the perfect end result, there's this gentleness to developer that really does notice when the mm. dial even moves a little bit. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I accept that, that's, uh, that's very <laughs> true. Yeah. yeah, and then it's nice to have a little execution in there uh, my, my achiever, and then uh, just uh, number 11 is a ranger, and then belief and responsibility are, are right up there, at, uh, 12, 13, I think. So uh, a lot of that sort of plays out. I, if I say I'm going to do something, I get it done. I get great joy out of checking things off the list and really feeling like, and, and I've learned to slice up my life a little bit, so I have that sense of moving through things. I've learned I need that even on retreats. Uh, I need to have some sense that we that we that we got somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that achiever comes out even in a, a retreat setting, and uh, and and that certainly helps to to move the ball forward. And and I love that. I I, I appreciate the fact that there are people who aren't achievers, but I don't really understand it from the inside. Uh, <laughs> I just right. acknowledge that that exists. Yes, exactly. Achievers typically, just for our audience's sake, have more stamina than most people. And it frustrates them that the, they kind of have to be always slowing down for other people to catch up. That can be really hard, which is why they love autonomy, why they often end up directors of things, um, because they really do set the pace. Um, and achiever kind of turbocharges everything else. So a profound positivity, somebody who is going to get incredible joy from calling out the best in others and is very good at it. Is not a flatterer is very good, especially with individualization, cheek by jowl with positivity. That ability to really see the uniqueness of the individual and call it out brings great joy, as you said, Father. Um, I guess I just wanted to say too that 
one of your techniques in a crowd is something that I've been teaching my more introverted clients for a while, and that is that I can be shy in certain circumstances, even though I have Wuhi. Like if I'm in a circumstance where I have nothing in common with anybody, and for me to even be a religious person would make everyone freak out and run away, I just focus on them. I use my number one input, like you, to just ask questions and interview everybody, and they have a wonderful time being drawn out, and I end up feeling really good with my positivity to notice what makes them light up and what matters to them, and so I end up having fun anyway. It's not as much fun as being with people that I can relate to more naturally, but still a shy person who's maybe relater and input can, or learner and, and, and relater can go in and say, I think I'll just learn a little bit about people, but I'm also going to give myself an exit strategy so that I can go and take care of myself and not be completely burned out at the end of the night. That's beautiful. It's such a joy to talk with you. I'm uh, appreciating this this uh, well-formed and, and sophisticated, nuanced uh, insight into strengths. This is really beautiful. Thank you so much, Father. I, that's how I felt when I was watching everybody. I, I got to see a webinar that Father did for some religious sisters, and I was geeking out because as a fellow input, he was pulling in brain science and doing such cool things with, like, but in a really loving and relatable way. Like, it was very relational. It wasn't like throwing numbers around or boring you to death with statistics. It was so good. It was so accessible. So I just love to see your talent themes up there. It explains a lot. <laughs> It does, yeah. yeah. And that's been my experience in, uh, as I mentioned, giving spiritual direction. Uh, some some themes, you know, or, or people that I've gotten to know, and it's like, well, and especially when, you know, a different part of somebody comes out in different settings or at different times, and when somebody might come into spiritual direction and they're a little bit more triggered, they're a little bit more defensive, and there's this part of them that I hadn't seen before. I have a a couple of people, I found this interesting combination between like belief and empathy. You know, somebody who's like number one belief, number two empathy. And and the, the belief gets really ramped up. And, and, you know, the way that it's supposed to be sort of comes out in this very principled approach. But then at the same time, they're, they're kind of self-aware that it's a little bit hard hitting. And, and in fact, it comes out when they get triggered because that sensitivity you know, makes them, they get hurt very easily. And then all of the belief comes out to protect them. And so it, it's this very interesting kind of dual combination that, that until I saw, oh, belief and empathy. And then I was able to see these are two different categories of this person. And I could see some of the interactions. It was a big help for me in being able to name. And when I saw the belief come out, I thought, I bet that uh, the belief come out strongly like a defense I thought, I bet that empathy, I bet that there's a real hurt that's going on there. And I was able to kind of tease that out a little bit and find out what was happening. And anyway, just uh, oh, those, uh, those insights that strengths give are, are so valuable for getting, uh, sort of holding the different dimensions of the person together uh, as a, you know, because we are, we do have sub-personalities. There's a, there's a part of me that's that's high uh, input. There's another part of me that relates with people, and and the parts can work together, but sometimes they get a little bit separated, and you don't always see both parts at the same time. Yeah, and another thing I like to notice, we're going to be wrapping up shortly, Father. So I want to give you the last comments and anything you think is important. But I also like to have clients kind of look at the places at the bottom that they wish they could be more of, and then just start to partner some of what's up at the top in ways that can become new pathways for achieving or becoming what it is they feel God is asking them to step into. They're like little Gideons. Or they're like, who, what, me? I'm not a mighty warrior. That's all down at the bottom of my talent themes. But wait a minute, here's a way that God may be calling me to express this mission a little differently and step into that. Um, would you just take us out, Father, with whatever you'd like to say? I'd love to hear what you think in terms of the bigger picture for the church or within your the work that you do directly. What are you seeing looking forward? Well, I, I just think it's huge for self-awareness and other awareness team building and you know uh, mutual understanding delegating uh, uh, it's why I, I enthusiastically teach this and to the seminarians and form them in it and give them the chance for coaching i just think that uh 
the, the opportunities for working with staff, working with volunteers, understanding their parishioners. And it's amazing how much you can get when you know strengths and you just get someone's profile, it gives you such a head start. I mean, we don't, we don't ever want to reduce somebody to something. We need to allow the person's particular embodiment of this combination of uniqueness uh, to emerge. But at the same time, it gives you a real fast look to where we can expect to find some of those talent themes and uh, those strengths in people. So I just think it's a, a huge value. In the church, we, uh, we have this interesting uh, benefit of we are a family and like a family, we're kind of stuck with each other. And so there's a lot that just keeps going. I mean, it, if the church were a business that had to stand on its own values, it would have died 2000 years ago. But because there's a supernatural animation and there's also a real coherence around each other and a mutual love for Jesus Christ who is the center and, and holds us together we kind of get like a freebie I mean we, we get a free pass but but learning the the human dimensions and learning to work with that and work with uh, with teams and really, really be able to draw the best out of our people to realize that our our pews are filled with talent that that can make a contribution to the gospel and Often they've excluded themselves from doing that because they don't see how their talents have to do with the proclamation of the gospel. They have some pigeonholed idea of what an evangelist ought to look like, and it doesn't look like them. Uh, and, and so for pastors to be able to call that out of people uh, and, and show them, you have, you have a necessary contribution to make. We can't do it without. And I need you to do these things. And for pastors to be able to own, I mean, I'm just very happy to say, like, I, I'm number 31, woo. I mean, I'm just not going to get better at that. Uh, it's like, I, I need other people that can break the ice. I'm uh, low, you know, self-assurance and communication, a bunch of the influencing strengths, other than Maximizer, which is top five, the rest of them are like down at the bottom. And I know I don't influence people. I convince people, I give people data, I love people, but I don't influence people like people with influencing strengths do. And I love working with, a guy like Pat Molyneux, who will be uh, following me up on the show, who introduced me to strengths, who, who have command, who are able to activate, who are able to you know, communicate, and uh, who are really able to influence. It's amazing what an impact that makes. And I love working hand, -to -hand, hand in hand with these people. And I, I don't need to do all the things. I can, I can do it together with other people. And I just think it's necessary. We talk about the body of parts, the body of Christ having many parts. And then we act as if everybody should be the same part. But we really need to lean into the fact, what does it mean to be a leg, to be an arm, to be an eye, to be a mouth, to be an ear, to be a heart, to be a brain? I mean, what does it mean to really do that and really work together in a coordinated way like a body does? And that's, I just think the church hasn't even begun to tap into the, the possibilities that are there given the fact that we are committed and we are together in spite of being such a disaster in so many places, <laughs> we clergy, I'm owning this for myself, you know, um, and, and, and even with that, we do so, we do so much, how much more we would be able to serve the world and build up the body of Christ if we really saw everybody's uniqueness and, and personal vocation through that. Mm, it's so pro-life to look at uniqueness, and it helps us also to be that bright city on a hill. Go back to John 10.10, 10, everybody. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We know that light comes from Christ. We don't shine of our own accord, but he wants us out there all lit up like Christmas. Oh, Father Boniface, thank you so much just for the love that you pour into everything that you do and, and for the way that you bring the kind of not only acceptance, which we desperately need, but also the ability to call out the best in others. Uh, praise be Jesus Christ that we are able to use these tools for his glory. Well said. Amen. It's been such a joy to talk with you, Lisa, really. Just uh, grateful for what you're doing and getting the word out there and especially in the, in the church to get people excited about this. It's not just, uh, I've looked at a bunch of other uh, profiles and, you know, different things have their own value, but I've not found the value in any other profile that I found in strength finders. It really uh, has withstood the test of time for me as a high input guy. I tend to bounce a bit, um, but strength finders is something that's just kept opening up new layers for me. And I found 
just tremendously valuable, accessible, uh, amazing in, in every setting. Yeah, amen to that, amen. There's an amazing subtlety, nuance, variety in it. I, I never hear the same talent theme expressed exactly the same way twice in my clients. It's remarkable. Um, and I'd also just like to let anyone who's had a bad experience with stuff that's a little weirdo or new agey, this stuff, Clifton Strengths has Christian roots. So we can feel really good about that and, and use it well as Catholics. All right, Father, thank you. Just really appreciate all that you poured into this interview, too, for being so present. And uh, everybody, find Father Boniface Hicks at the St. Vincent Seminary. Uh, we've got it in the show notes, but he can be found at imf.stvincentseminary.edu. That's their general information email. Um, we really appreciate, appreciate your being with us, Father Boniface. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. God bless you and God bless all those whose lives you're touching. Um, everybody who's watching, thank you for being with us. And you can learn even more about growing your natural talents at my website too, wonderfully made. 139.com. So see you next time for another episode of Wonderfully Made. And please do subscribe and share so you never have to miss an episode. Bye now.